This is an unreleased 3DFX Voodoo 5 6000 GPU, or actually set of GPUs. We have two. It's built on a custom 80 watt Strange God board with four 166 megahertz 3DFX VSA 100 Napalm chips in double SLI. It has a 66 megahertz AGP 1.0 interface, six pin PCIe power input, 16 16 megabyte SDR SD RAM chips for a total of 256 megabytes of onboard memory and dual V BIOS for 128 or 256 megabyte memory mode. The card was doomed when it was being made by 3DFX and it was one of their last products. And this card shouldn't exist. There's no such thing as a retail Voodoo 5 6000. They're handmade by Anthony or ZXC64 who manages to source the parts for the actual GPU, the real GPUs that 3DFX made via TSMC and put them on a new board. As a hobby, he hand assembles and sells custom cards, including 3DFX's lost crown jewel. He designs and orders PCBs, then populates them with new old stock. They're 3DFX chips purchased in bulk, usually taking three days to assemble each card once they arrive. And no one has produced a Voodoo 5 6000 for over 20 years. The last people who did never shipped it. They didn't make it to market before 3DFX crumbled. And this ends up being a relic lost to time that we have the privilege of testing and showing you functional in an actual system. So this is the card we bought from Anthony ZXC64. We paid about $1,500 US for it and let's get started. This video is brought to you by us and our project and soldering mat on store.gamersaccess.net. Our mat actually got used during this video to solder and swap some small components on the Voodoo 6000 card that we're reviewing today. It provides a large enough surface for this four GPU card, our microscope, board heater, and soldering tools. These 32 inch by 16 inch mats are wide enough to fit laptops or other hobbyist projects and small parts repair. And because they're made of resilient silicone, they're easily cleaned with water and a washcloth. The mats aren't only for high heat board repairs, but also for projects where you need to organize tools like your screwdrivers, tweezers, adhesives, and other parts. Grab one on store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly and get something high quality in return. Just for an idea of the rarity, it took over three years since the cancellation of this project for extreme tech's Joel Hruska to get his hands on one and produce what he called the first review of the Voodoo 5 6000. And that extreme tech review was back in 2003. Now, today, with the help of a collector, Anthony was able to borrow a damaged and non-functional unit. And from there, he posted Facebook updates to a ZXC64 page showing the non-destructively reverse engineering that he did and building a new card from scratch. Now, this process could technically have just been emulated. You don't have to build one of these anymore. You can fake it through basically software and some modern hardware. And this is a point that actually 3DFX's own founders pointed out in an interview. It, just out of curiosity, why are they doing that instead of emulating it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, why is a silly question. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, but uh, th because they can. And in an interview with Custom PC, ZXC64 stated, quote, making the PCB wasn't very complicated. I placed all the design blocks around the board and solved the puzzle that way. There were no other available variations. Now we get the feeling that he's underselling himself here. He's gone as far as to make multiple revisions of a card left abandoned, including extended memory, PCI interfaces, a replacement for the barrel jack power plug that was originally intended to go on the back of this and other variations as well. Uh, for example, VGA pass-through and different power configurations. And that's why we're so excited to look at this today because this is real engineering. ZXC64 took abandoned derelict hardware that was lost to time, reverse engineered it and made something that works and is actually better than how 3DFX designed it with all the extra features. Before we start testing it though, we're gonna go through some of the history of 3DFX and catch everyone up to speed on what really this card is and what it was originally meant to be. The $299 or $500 adjusted dual chip Voodoo 5 5500 was the first and only 250 nanometer VSA 100 based Voodoo 5. And that's VSA as in Voodoo Scalable Architecture. It made it to market in June of 2000, followed by the budget single chip Voodoo 4 4500 in October. 
The Voodoo 5 6000 had four GPUs on one card. Some prototype Voodoo 5 6000s used a supplementary 4-pin Molex power connector, but the retail product would have had a barrel jack to take power from an external AC Voodoo Volts 50-watt power adapter. 3DFX was showing off a prototype Voodoo 5 6000 as late as September 2000, with Eurogamer remarking on the what they called obscene size at 12 inches, crazy MSRP at $600 or $1,000 adjusted for today, and power requirements of 60 watts. We've come a long way to our 500 watt, $1,600 cards that are 14 inches long. 3DFX Interactive was founded in 1994 by former Silicon Graphics Incorporated staff at a point where Enterprise 3D had been dominated by SGI for years and PC 3D didn't exist outside of CAD hardware. For more on SGI though, check out our Indigo 2 Extreme and O2 videos that we made with the help of SGI Depot. 3DFX dabbled in some government and arcade sales to start with, but its goal was always the console-dominated home gaming market that SGI had actually intentionally avoided, much to its demise later, because it believed that the market was incapable of supporting expensive GPU hardware. It only wanted to sell to companies for tens of thousands of dollars. So 3DFX was a breakout. There was some internal debate over whether its first box product should be an add-in card or a motherboard. There was a mindset that this is going to be a motherboard. And it was kind of... See, a, he always tries to hang that on me. But in 1996, 3DFX partnered with Orchid Technology to release the Righteous 3D, which is an AIC powered by the original Voodoo Graphics 3D chip. 3DFX managed to convince Orchid to sell the 3DFX product without ever having a physical prototype. And we had already signed up Fujitsu and Orchid to sell our products even though we didn't have any products to sell, and um, talked Orchid into letting us put the Reality Engine in their booth at Comdex, behind a wall. It was purely off the strength of pre-rendering demos on SGI hardware without anything physical to work from. They basically said, yeah, it'll probably look like this. For that matter, there weren't any existing PC games that could even leverage the chips. 3DFX had to develop demos in-house. 3DFX developed its own API as well, Glide, since SGI's OpenGL wasn't initially built to support gaming. The Orchid Righteous 3D is the card that famously made an audible click Achtung. when the 3D hardware activated and closed relays, enabling the VGA pass-through. That was a feature. Because <laughs> you knew it was time to have fun. <laughs> As the box states, quote, other 3D solutions replace your existing 2D adapter and may compromise performance. Righteous 3D is a dedicated 3D accelerator that works transparently with your 2D adapter. So, in other words, it used a VGA pass-through in conjunction with a separate 2D graphics card. This offered a genuine performance advantage over contemporary 3D-2D combo cards, and it also allowed 3D effects to brush past the existing legacy of 2D graphics cards and make something entirely new and exciting. And the timing was perfect. Windows 95 had just launched. Taskbars and email and shortcuts, oh my. Everyone was buying new PCs with PCI slots, and PC gaming was about to become mainstream. And this was a period when software and hardware development were racing forward hand in hand. Quake launched in 1996 with software rendering, but in 1997, GL Quake was launched with OpenGL support, which at the time really just meant voodoo support. And John Carmack joined 3DFX's advisory board. We were doing tests with a very popular game called uh, GL Quake, and it was running at 120 frames per second, um, which is just silly. I mean, nobody's going to run a game at, uh, at that kind of frame rate or want to. 3DFX was on fire at this time, and they were just getting started. Voodoo cards were must-have hardware for early 3D games like Tomb Raider especially so for Glide-enabled titles like Unreal and Unreal Tournament. 3DFX had its IPO in 1997. There were some minor stumbles that year, like the ill-fated Voodoo Rush, as well as leaking the existence of the Dreamcast and torpedoing a potentially profitable contract with Sega, but things were still trending upwards overall. 1998's Voodoo 2 and Banshee releases marked the peak of 3DFX's success, with IGN reporting via PC data that the top five GPUs sold in fourth quarter 1998 were all Voodoo-based. 
73% of performance and gaming graphics market share was held by 3DFX in early 99. That's almost exactly like Nvidia's current position today, including the market share percentage and it's a reminder of just how fickle the graphics market is. The Voodoo 2 was the first consumer card to utilize 3DFX's scalable scan line interleave technology to link multiple cards together. The original Voodoo chips had that capability, but it went unused. The abbreviation SLI was coined, and it was notoriously later purchased by NVIDIA and uh, backronymed into scalable link interface. Through the release of the Banshee 3DFX's first 2D, 3D combo card, 3DFX relied entirely on board partners like Diamond, Creative Labs, and STB, doing zero first-party hardware production itself. In late 1998, 3DFX's board decided it was ready to live the dream by blowing $141 million, or about $243 million in today's numbers, on its major board partner, STB, based in Mexico. You can't take a high-flying, high-multiple, high-technology, uh, sexy 3D graphics chip company and marry it with a marginal piece of crap board company <laughs> come out of it with anything that's good. Buying a manufacturer allowed 3DFX to immediately shift from 0% to 100% in-house manufacturing not including the TSMC manufactured silicon, and yes, they were still around back then. It also allowed it to push out its partners, who all promptly turned to the competitor, NVIDIA. If, uh, if that sounds familiar to you, it did to us too. It's kind of amazing how a too big to fail company can immediately implode when it decides to treat its partners as commodities. As the number of competitors scrambling to keep up in an oversaturated market ballooned, 3DFX's designs fell into a rut of recycling old hardware and repeatedly diverting short-term resources away from its next-gen Rampage project, which was delayed past relevance. DirectX became increasingly dominant in games, and adoption of 3DFX's Glide API was limited. As Anand Shimpy said at the time, Quote, 3DFX is back with the third installment in the Voodoo Trilogy, but unlike George Lucas's award-winning creation, this sequel isn't something to get your hopes too high for. And that was written before episode one, so uh, don't, don't get your hopes up too high for the Phantom Menace there, Anand. 3DFX's lead continued to shrink with the launch of NVIDIA's GeForce 2 in May of 2000. NVIDIA focused on sales to OEMs like Dell and HP, while 3DFX stuck to the relatively small, high-end enthusiast market. The wheels fell off rapidly, with 3DFX shuttering STB just two years after the acquisition, and then dumping all of its remaining assets on NVIDIA after creditors started bankruptcy proceedings. The final physical prototypes produced by 3DFX were of the long-delayed and eventually canceled Voodoo 5 6000, bringing us back to what we have today, and there were also some number of Spectre 1000 Rampage cards which eventually started initial testing just days before the company ceased to exist. If you've got a Spectre, email us. Given the larger-than-life impression that 3DFX made on everyone, we know, we've seen your comments, it's bizarre to think that it only took four years to go from the release of the first Voodoo card to total collapse. You know, that's what makes this company so amazing and such a long-term win. They were gambling this risk, and I thought, that's not a bad train to jump on. Now to the fun part, which is acquiring parts to build the system that is worthy of a Voodoo 5 6000 so that we can actually test it. We spent a lot of time on this. Actually, most of it was kind of in this phase of trying to get things to work. And our plan, uh, baseline requirements here were Windows 9, Five or 9.8. So 95, 98 had to be used. And we also needed an AGP 1.0 compatible motherboard, which is actually kind of rare, at least in a class that is worthy of the Voodoo 5 6000. So we started discussion with Anthony about what we should use. And then we also perused some old motherboard roundups from Anand Shimpy on uh, Anantech. And this is what we came up with. This is an MSI KT3 Ultra. It is a really good board from the era. In fact, Anantec gave it an Editor's Choice Award, and uh, Mr. Shimpy himself really liked this board, as did Anthony, who, again, hand-built these cards. So that's what we went with. As for what we paired that board with, it was an AMD Athlon XP 2600 Plus Thoroughbred from 2002. And that 
is from the classic AMD era where 2600 plus meant 2133 megahertz. Not, not what the plus means, but unfortunately for us, the MSI KD3 Ultra board that we sought for weeks on eBay uh, showed up and it was DOA on arrival. That's what the A means. DOA, the, the A is arrival. Anyway, our friends at the Cramden Institute, which is a local e-waste recycling facility, they were able to help us out. We contacted them. We said, needs to be able to run Windows 95 or 8, needs to be AGP 1.0. Please, do you have anything? And they were able to secure us an extremely beige and extremely 1999 Dell Dimension. Normally, you have to pay $4 for these from Cramden for just sort of the scrap metal fee. They waived that $4 for us. They probably feel bad for us. Uh, so thank you, Cramden. It helped. So the Dell Dimension XPS T600 is what we had as our backup. Out of the box, this one came with a 600 megahertz Pentium 3. It had 128 megabytes of RAM, a Sirius Logic PCI GPU, a 10100 NIC, and a 10 gigabyte hard drive, all of which actually was still functional. We upgraded it with a viewer donated e-waste 800 megahertz CPU and some memory harvested from a crumbling homemade RAM Christmas wreath also from a viewer. So if you sent either of those in years ago, probably four or five years ago now, they found a home and it actually is what was able to get us through this piece. Thank you. Once we confirmed that the Voodoo 5 6000 worked with the viewer donated hardware, we next moved forward and bought a different board. And that is the Epox 8K 3A motherboard using the VIA 333 chipset, the KT333. That was reportedly the most stable platform for these tests, according to, again, Anthony and old forum posts. The system was a complete nightmare to get running. We've been working on this piece between reviews for something like three years on and off. It's not like we were working out the whole time, but every time we had a breather, it was this that Patrick would work on. The sweet spot for compatibility with the Voodoo 5 6000 is Windows 90 something. So we installed Windows 98 SE with the unofficial service pack 3.66 on our test bench. We had constant resource conflict problems on the 8K 3A due to the unusually high amount of VRAM. Remember, the card is modified by Anthony to have more memory than these were ever supposed to have, plus it didn't officially ship anyway. So Windows didn't really know what to do with it, but we were able to figure it out. And what we ended up doing for a workaround was booting in and out of DOS mode, but the permanent fix was to carefully desolder and move one of the SMDs on the Snow White in order to reduce the required AGP aperture size. After a couple weeks of on and off troubleshooting with this card, our original Voodoo 5 6000, we tried working through the artifacting, the crashes in multi-GPU mode, which is required because there's four GPUs on the card, and we narrowed down our remaining problems to the card, unfortunately. And uh, Anthony was able to swap it out for us with the one in front of me here, and we just transplanted the heat sinks. In fairness to Anthony, this is not necessarily his fault, because in researching all of this, the Voodoo 5 5500s had these exact problems. Every bug we ran into happened on the 5500s. So the reproduction of the Voodoo card is true even down to the bugs. Uh, that's, I mean, if you wanted a true reproduction, that's a good thing. For comparison, we're testing a couple of roughly contemporary AGP cards that have been sent to us by viewers over the years. The 1998 Real 3D i740 Starfighter, one of the cards that 3DFX actually helped to kill, and the 2000 NVIDIA GeForce 2 GTS, one of the cards that helped kill 3DFX. We thought it was fun for it to be flanked that way. Real 3D was actually a spin-off of Lockheed Martin. Yes, that Lockheed Martin. <laughs> that jointly developed the i740 as what they called Project Auburn with Intel and Chips and Technology Incorporated, making this the only consumer Intel DGPU until ARC, other than the elusive i752. And yes, Intel named its debut i740 Starfighter after the notoriously accident-prone F-104 Widowmaker, also known as the Starfighter. And we have a lot of those cards on the table here with me today. Now, the i740 was meant to champion AGP in opposition to Voodoo. 
to the 3DFX, and especially in opposition to the widespread PCI standard, which had only just started to switch over to AGP in a meaningful way. But as a mediocre budget card, it immediately got stomped by 3DFX and the Voodoo 2. Shortly after all this, Real 3D was shuttered in October of 1999, and Intel shifted to integrated graphics for the next two decades, with the arguable exception of Larrabee. The GeForce 2 series would have been the direct competitor to the last of the 3DFX Voodoo generation cards. But with the fall of 3DFX, it was left to just compete with ATI Radeon cards instead. That was before AMD purchased them. Now, our GeForce 2 GTS, which stands for Giga Texel Shader, is the original 32 megabyte launch model. So that's what we used here. Now we're getting to the testing. This is normally where we go through some methodology and tell you why our testing for whatever the part is, is going to be accurate. In this instance, it's a little different. So we're working with cards and products that are outside the area of direct expertise that Patrick and I have. It sort of predates any testing we did. Uh, so that's a thing to be aware of. Additionally, we are working with community sourced drivers, an unofficial service pack for Windows 98. Uh, we had to hack a bunch of stuff together. We're testing software that favors Voodoo sort of intentionally for a fun showcase because frankly, it uh, it doesn't matter. We're not re reviewing these for which old video card you should buy. Uh, but in every test, performance and stability of the card varied heavily depending on what we were testing. And uh, it sort of makes sense. It also depended on whether or not Anthony's extra added VRAM was detected and functional for that software. We tried drivers from Amiga Merlin 2.9, Raziel 64 1.01.16, and the Voodoo 5 6000 Resource Group 1.05.04. And again, it's a handmade card with real silicon from that era, but none of it ever made it to market. So the numbers are just for fun. That's kind of what we're getting at here. Overclocking is supported through the 3DFX tools, but because of how limited these are and how difficult they were to get to work, we decided not to venture into overclocking for this one just to be safe. Uh, it, it is really finicky after all, and this is antique hardware. And we did one last pass in single chip mode as well, just to get sort of a like-for-like-ish comparison to uh, the Voodoo 4. That's effectively what it turns into when you remove the other three GPUs. As for benchmarking, we'll start with Quake 3 Arena, a game that's strongly associated with Voodoo. Despite that association, none of the 90s Quake Trilogy games natively support the Glide API. Instead, they use OpenGL with an optional Glide wrapper. As a result, there's a quarter century's worth of opinions about the best way to run Quake 3 as recently as the last couple years. We just installed the game, patched it, used the vanilla 3DFX VGL.DLL for the Voodoo card, and we maxed out the settings. We used id's 4 demo for testing, that was the name of it. Here's the chart. Our best stable result for the Voodoo card was with a driver downloaded from the Voodoo 5 6000 resource group. There was minor scaling with VRAM on this driver with a 4% uplift going from 128 megabytes to 256 megabyte mode. Switching to single chip mode massively downgraded performance, so it shows that the multi-chips are working. But this also helps illustrate how the GeForce 2 was able to outperform the single chip Voodoo Force, which again, a single chip Voodoo 5 here sort of is. NVIDIA's card averaged 81 FPS, which is 154% ahead of single chip mode, while the full performance Voodoo 5 6000 actually manages to outperform the GeForce 2 by 42%. We had to switch to the crammed in old Pentium 3 system to get the i740 to work properly, and even then it couldn't handle rendering the 2D 1280 by 1024 desktop at 32 BBP. Our Starfighter is the 8 megabyte model with no slot for extra memory. That was a feature on some variants actually, it's not a joke, but it wasn't on this one. Quake 3 refused to even launch with the i740 installed. Up next, Unreal Tournament 99 was Glide's killer app. Unreal Tournament has true native Glide support, as well as Direct 3D for the NVIDIA and Intel cart. Theoretically, we could just slap a nick in our bench and join a server, but we used the city intro scene for benchmarking instead, and we patched up the game to version 436. We saw heavy texture artifacting in an Unreal Tournament on our Voodoo 5, which correlated directly with the texture detail setting. 
The Raziel 64 driver didn't offer the best average frame rates, but it did sidestep most of the artifacting issues while introducing its own issues. Using the VRG driver, we saw a 62% performance increase from 41 FPS, single chip Voodoo 5, to 66 FPS on the NVIDIA GeForce 2. It's a smaller gap than in Quake 3, but still an advantage for NVIDIA. This is 3DFX's home turf. With all four Voodoo GPUs working together, the stable Raziel 64 result is 69% ahead of NVIDIA's card, while the Artifact EVRG result is 77% ahead at 117 FPS average. Moving on to 1024 by 768, the Starfighter did actually manage to run Unreal Tournament, but only at this resolution. The launcher recommends software, or CPU, rendering for older cards, and it explicitly mentions the i740, but we used Direct3D to load the GPU. Intel averaged 23 FPS, with the Voodoo 5 170% ahead at 63 FPS average. The Voodoo card is hugely restricted by the old Pentium 3, though, which is the reason we invested in a new motherboard and CPU. Bottlenecking and benchmarks is just as much a problem with these tests as in modern configurations. So we did as much as we could with the old new stock, or just the old old stock that was available online. Up next is 3D Mark 99. UL hosts free licensed copies of legacy Future Mark suites, going all the way back to the original 3D Mark 99 DX6 benchmark. 3D Mark has been a DirectX only benchmark since its inception, so this test doesn't favor Voodoo as much as the games we selected. We found the Amiga Merlin Voodoo driver offered the best performance, but again, each driver had its own quirks. The trilinear filtering test didn't render correctly on Amiga Merlin, while the NVIDIA card had consistent problems with misshapen polygons in the 3D test. This test does provide the best example, though, of Anthony's 256 megabyte memory mode, actually helping here, as the 32 megabyte texture test ran extremely poorly in 128 megabyte mode. In 256 megabyte mode, though, one edge of the texture consistently showed corruption, so we may have a bad memory chip or it may be a software issue. Amiga Merlin's 128 megabyte test scored 11,043 3D marks. It's still 53% ahead of the GeForce 2 GTS here, even in the DirectX application. The GeForce 2 7219 point average in turn outperformed the single chip Voodoo by 156%. On the older Pentium 3 platform and at 1024 by 768, the CPU score is less than a third of what it is with the Athlon, giving us a better picture of the bottleneck. Still, the Voodoo managed a 342% advantage over the i740's original score at 5924 points versus 1339. The Voodoo card here won in every category except trilinear filtering. The i740 was incapable of running the bump mapping tests, but those aren't factored into the overall score. Even with all of that, if the Voodoo 5 6000 made it to market back when it were relevant, it could not have saved 3DFX. The company was doomed and one product launch wouldn't have changed anything. And the Rampage wouldn't have saved them either. They were going up NVIDIA, which was far more calculating at the time. NVIDIA was pursuing the OEM relationships and getting far cheaper, simpler cards into widespread systems to collect some of that money up front. And NVIDIA was fighting a resource battle, whereas 3DFX was still focused on just the smallest part of the enthusiast market. So NVIDIA's advantage was less exciting, and nearly everyone agrees that 3DFX's fate was sealed the moment it decided to acquire STB. And based on the Computer History Museum's interview, it sounds like the nearly everyone actually includes nearly everyone who is relevant. Three co-founders and the original CEO all came to the same conclusion that buying STB was a mistake, and this is even back in the day. They were obligated to go along with the board's vote. If 3DFX had played nice with board partners and moved more quickly on Rampage, it may have been a different story, or maybe not, with the imminent rise of Radeon just after it. But this is an example where Nvidia pursuing the money first and figuring out the high-end cards later benefited it. I look at it today, all it does is high-end right now in the 40 series era, and uh, it gave them a resource advantage that 3DFX simply didn't have, especially after spending so much of its war chest on acquiring a board partner that just wasn't up to what they needed to do. Plus, it burned all the partnerships. Anthony is unable to accept payments for these cards right now, uh, so his orders are closed at the moment. 
for what it's worth, we paid $1,500 or something around there when we ordered ours. And he does make them and sell them. So as soon as he's accepting payments, maybe he'll open up orders and you'll be able to grab one if you want some collectible memorabilia that actually works or mostly works. It works within the parameters of these cards working back in the day. As we said, it contains even the bugs that they had. So it's a true representation. Anyway, this piece was a lot of fun. It was a massive amount of work. So Patrick alone has over something like 60, 70 hours on this thing, uh, not counting the work that he did initially two years ago when we were first starting to troubleshoot stuff. But it's not like it took the whole time. It's just on and off. You, when you run into troubleshooting bugs and you have to source old parts, it takes some time to do. So go to store.gamersaccess.net and grab one of our brand new solder mats if you'd like to support this type of historical deep dive and look at hardware like 3D FX's Voodoo 5 6000. Really unique and fun content to work on. We appreciate you all watching it. Subscribe for more as always, and we'll see you all next time.